give me the nod whenever we're ready. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome everybody um, out there in the realm of virtuality and um, you've been listening to New Order here at the Poetry Center station. And um, we've had a, a, a special reading today where a few of us are in person, a number of people here in the audience in the house at the Poetry Center, San Francisco State University campus, and, uh, and a number of you are out there in the, in the realm of wherever you are. And, um, but um, three people who attended school here together years ago and have um, remained friends, and each has um, new books of fiction out. And so Matthew Clark Davison is, is here at SF State and has been a teacher for many students here. His um, novel, Doubting Thomas, is, is brand new. Um, we're going to have the writers introduce one another. I asked them to do that because they have a personal edge you know, that they will bring to their introductions. And Stacy Flood is also here. Um, we'll be reading from Saltfields, The Saltfields, his first novella. And Patrick Earl Ryan reading from If We Were Electric, um, which um, is a book of short stories. And so the way we're going to do it is um, I asked the third person to introduce the first person. The first person introduces the second person. The second person introduces the third person. So please welcome to the stage Patrick Earl Ryan. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming and or listening at home. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing, and I'll keep this short, I have the pleasure of introducing Stacy Flood, um, who uh, we went to school together, of course, here at State, uh, all three of us. And um, I have memories, of course, of, of uh, Stacy and I. We worked together on 14 Hills, um, which is a, the wonderful literary journal here at SF State. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a bio for Stacy, and then he can read for you. Stacy D. Flood, originally from Buffalo and currently living in Seattle, has had his work published nationally and performed on stages nationwide, as well as in the Puget Sound area. He has been an artist in residence at Disquiet in Lisbon, as well as Malay Arts in New York, and he is the recipient of a Getty Fellowship to the Community of Writers, published in 2021 by Lantern Fish Press. The Salt Fields is his first novella. So please welcome Stacy D. Flood. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you to everyone online as well. It's just such a pleasure to be back at SF State um, and to be in this room again. So thank you again for, to everyone. I'll read just a section that kind of goes over where the main character um, starts the journey. The book itself is about a train ride during the Great Migration in about 1947, um, and about four people who actually take this journey together. So this is from the... Uh, perspective of a character who's named Minister. I wore my best pinstripe suit to the railway station with the same chestnut and white two-tone spats that I wore to my graduation and wedding. In the front breast pocket, I placed a small photograph of my daughter, crumpled at the edges, creased across the middle. I hadn't realized how much weight I lost until I wrapped that suit around me and tied a loose half Windsor knot into my tie. The suit itself was fawn in color, linen, with cloud white pinstripes, totally wrong for my complexion, I had been told. But it was comfortable, and for me it represented the chrysalis from which I was to emerge. Once I descended the three stairs from the front porch to the concrete walkway, the other steps came quickly. I meant to turn around for one last look, but by the time I thought to do so, I was over a block away and couldn't see the house anymore. From there, I kept walking, past sunflowers, fields of wilted grass, bells of autumn hay, even the Richardson property, without breaking stride. The farther I walked, the more the colors around me softened. By now, though, most of the farms were little more than sand and rotting plywood. The only voices were cicadas that fell silent as I approached and began their whispers again when I had passed. At the edge of my vision, I saw the well. The police had warned us not to use the water for a few days, 
after they remove my daughter's body because sometimes a body can contaminate the supply. Sometimes some of the skin stays behind. The emptiness in my suit allowed for a degree of cushioning against the sun. My heel scraped against the bone pale, dead white dust and loose rocks. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't find a rhythm to my steps. I didn't whistle, nor hum, and my mouth dried, my throat grew parched, and that was okay with me, since I couldn't find a single reason why I'd ever need to speak again. For those I left behind, I knew my voice was already a memory, and I knew that this place, my home, would forget about the rest of me as soon as my shoes left the, pave the pebbles and pavement beneath them. Even when I was a child, trains never held much fascination for me. And as an adult, I never bought into the romance or mysticism that said that they could take me to a utopia beyond my current vision. I just needed one to take me to someplace slightly better, far away, where I could try to forget the rest of myself and replace it with whatever was around me. The railway station was obscured by swirls of dry afternoon and glazed sunlight. Each of us collected there that morning, young and old alike, had a vision of the North as some sort of paradise, so we were dressed accordingly. Yet all the people, even whites, held a sense of, sense of regret on their faces, as if this quest for a new life signified a failure in or desertion of their old. Handkerchiefs wiped foreheads and were held in front of mouths as suitcases were carried inside. People squinted towards the sun for a heavenly answer as to why they were being roasted on what might be their last day in South Carolina. Young men smoked cigarettes. Old white men patrolled the entrance, looking for sharecroppers to stop and harass. But once my eyes met theirs, they let me pass freely enough. I was less important to them than even I imagined. Tap dancers, some younger than my lost child, shuffled for change or ceremony. Romanesque pil pillars stood at the front of the main whites only entrance freshly painted, with flecks of dirt caught in the ridges carved to look classical and permanent. The colored entrance was along the side of the station, closer to the actual tracks, where the paint chipped and exposed the pine flesh beneath. There was a single common platform, dense with sweat and anticipation. I took my suitcase under my arm and presented my ticket to the porter, a stout, dark man who lived in one of the adjoining cities and whose cousin once owned the local pharmacy. We didn't acknowledge each other, though, as if already I was distant and transformed into someone new, someone he didn't recognize. As crowded as the bench was, I was able to squeeze onto the edge and, like the rest of the occupants, turned my head expectantly toward the direction in which the train would arrive. Although I held no admiration for the machines themselves, what I've always liked about train tracks is the way they converge on the horizon and give the impression that someday, inevitably, Pleasantly, the future will come to a fixed point, a sharp, metallic conclusion. They give the illusion that whatever is lost can easily be replaced by distance. In less than an hour, that horizon was broken by a tall, thin cloud of smoke. Children in tall, thin socks and patent leather shoes, polished enough to show perfect reflections of the families around them, raced to the edge of the platform for a closer look. As the lone black dot neared, adults began gathering their belongings. Rather than a grinding, we heard a squeaking of metal and crunching of sand. Rather than anticipation, there was a feeling of resolve. When I looked towards the front of the station, I saw a young white woman, she didn't appear older than 17, sitting still on a cast iron bench amongst the commotion. Even though she was visibly pregnant, no one helped her. And when another porter tried, she ignored him and instead squinted forward, away from the train, into nothingness, waiting. I turned my glance downward. By the time the dawn lightning rolled into the station, I'd mopped the sweat from my neck, brow, and palms, and had counted the splintering planks on the platform floor at least a dozen times. I counted the nails which attached them at least a dozen more. Atop the plank closest to me, a maelstrom of ants circled, circled something invisible. People rose and stood in line to board. I stayed on the bench a moment longer, 
watching pigtails bounce above the bright wide eyes of small children, excited for their longtime dream of a train ride to come true. Their mothers and fathers followed in stick shawls worn over, worn over summer dresses and suit coats over frayed suspenders and or coveralls. Moth eaten, too heavy for the hot weather, but the easiest way to transport what one owned. When I looked for the young pregnant woman, she was gone. Only then did I board the train myself. Perhaps I should have waited a little longer. When I entered my appointed car, the aisles were still crowded with travelers waiting for, for others to make a decision. Baggage was stacked to the sides and around us, as if taking priority over the passengers. I searched for familiar faces, not expecting or finding any, and then took the nearest available seat on the aisle, facing the rest of the car in the back of the train, so that I could only see where I'd been, which was fine, so that I really didn't care where I was headed, and placed my suitcase in my lap. I imagined others were watching me, but they weren't. Somewhere a baby cried and was silenced. Across the Pullman coach, in a window seat, sat a small boy, hair cut close to the scalp, with a suitcase in his lap, and a crinkled newspaper open to the comic section. He didn't acknowledge anyone at all, only stared out the window as if longing for home. This container was my world for now, and beyond its walls, there was a well I wanted to forget. I sank into the thin upholstery as much as I could, breathing the stifling air as slowly as possible, savoring my share. I wanted to ease into sleep and dream another life until I arrived at a location where I could actually build one. The first thing I noticed was the uniform. I'd seen an army uniform before, but usually on paler skin or partially constructed, an army shirt with blue jeans or army trousers with a white t-shirt. I see the wearer holding a bottle of Coca-Cola or a glass of iced tea on a late summer afternoon, surrounded by family members celebrating his return. Carvel, however, wore his full dress uniform, hat, tie, and all, which made the other passengers pause a moment and take notice. In turn, Carvel seemed uncomfortable with the attention, which might have been why he chose to sit down right next to me instead of taking advantage of the empty bench that faced us. He slid his duffel bag beneath the seat, then removed his hat and placed it on his lap. Davinian and Lana were the last two people to settle their things, although I seen them enter the train long before I did. They switched mul seats multiple times before selecting the last two in the coach, the ones across from Carvel and me. Like many of the passengers, they were dressed in their first Sunday best, but their first Sunday best apparel was of higher quality than many of us were fortunate enough to own. The Vinian wore a tie that seemed to change in hue and pattern as you watched it, and Lana flaunted, flaunted strand after strand of white pearls. Each shimmered a watery blue under the bright glint of the sun, resplendent. She was stunning in a beige dress with cream lace and accents. Lana was lighter skinned, Davinian darker. The two complemented each other. Davinian removed his fedora and wiped his handkerchief across his brow while Lana waited some time to take off a wide brimmed hat. When she did, I noticed that she had a mesmerizing eyes whose liquid hazelnut brilliance exuded clarity of soul. Once they were settled, Davinian by the window, Lana on the aisle with a, with a small valise on her lap, Carvel introduced himself and stretched his hand out to Davinian, who shook it with the same warmth that was offered before introducing himself and his wife. What did you serve, Davinian asked. Before Carvel had a chance to answer, Lana asked me, do you know how long this trip is gonna take? They say about a day, I answered. About a day, she repeated to Davinian. It'll be over sooner than you think, Davinian replied. Lana then reached a glove hand into her purse, pulled out two wrapped pieces of hard candy, gave one to Davinian, and opened the other for herself. She placed the candy on her tongue, looked away from all of us through the window across the aisle, and waited until the train pulled away from the station into the expanding sunlight, away from the station's shadow and gravity, to swallow. I looked out the same window towards the shrinking platform, curious as to what interested her so much, because all I saw was a chaos of insects and ash 
tin cans filled with tobacco spit that were rusting in the sun. I saw a woman standing at a station platform trying to purchase a ticket. An old man sat on a bench near the platform, staring intently in the direction the trains had traveled from, as if he were waiting for something else, something better to follow. The train rattled, metal, metal jolt, jolting metal, as cinders and traces of coal streaked the windows, each flaked the color of pepper, carrying a sharp scent throughout the coach. You had to blink through the fog of heat, noise, sweat, and conversation to maintain your bearing. Unlike Davinian, I wiped my brow with the back of my hand for fear that my handkerchief would never dry. We were moving. But on that platform, that old man's gaze didn't change. We were the only daily train. No others would follow. What was he waiting for? My father, my uncle, a slave ship, a tall ship, something ancient to return, but there was only smoke. We were like the nautical travelers of ages ago, headed towards the edge of the earth, unconcerned with falling over. All we had was faith and what we could barely see beside or behind us, but we were eager for change, anything different, even drowning. By the next morning, we would be reborn. Deep down, many of us didn't trust or believe the newspapers or store catalogs that had promised a better life hundreds of miles colder. Many of those who traveled north before us had never returned, or we never heard from them again. As far as we knew, we were heading straight for the precipice, into salvation or perdition, and we were fine with either. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Matthew Clark Davison, who is just a fantastic author, fantastic friend, and if those who know him as an instructor know how much passion he puts into that as well. So Matthew Clark Davison is the author of Doubting Thomas, Amble Press, 2021. He's creator and teacher of the lab, creative classes with MCD, a non-academic school started in 2007 in a friend's living room on Douglas Street. The textbook version of the lab, co-authored by best-selling author Alice LaPlante, will be published by Norton. His prose has been published on, in or on Bomb, Lit Hub, Lambda Literary, The Advocate, Foglifter, and others, and has been recognized with the Creative Work Grant, Cultural Equities Grant, Clark Gross Award for a Novel in Progress, and a Stonewall Alumni Award. He earned a BA and MFA in Creative Writing from SFSU, where he now teaches full-time in the BA, MA, MFA departments. Please welcome Matthew Clark Davis. All right, I asked um, Stacy. that was a wonderful reading. Um, I asked Steve if it was okay to take off my mask, if everybody feels okay, just because, um, well, I, I really brush my teeth in case it's a bad reading. <laughs> oh, but it's such an incredible pleasure to be here. I have so many memories of being in this room with both um, Stacy and Patrick from, from, you know, when did we graduate? I don't even remember. Was it 2000? 2001. 2000 for me, I think. 2000 for Stacy. And also, uh, um, thank you for everyone at the Poetry Center for hosting us today. My novel, Doubting Thomas, um, starts with an accusation um, a, kid, a school teacher named Thomas McGurin gets accused of uh, um, inappropriately touching a fourth grader in his class. And he's been a beloved teacher in uh, this community for years. And then he loses his job because uh, even though he was um, you know, really, really clear, they did exhaustive investigations and found that he did not do what the parents thought he might have done. And this sort of flashes back to right before this happens. Chapter four. Mid-February, 2013. Every five years or so, it snowed enough to turn Portland from green to white. While visitors loved the city's flora, it could assert itself on its inhabitants like a bully, reminding everyone who ruled. Douglas and silver firs ganged up with western hemlocks. The forest provided cover, but also cast shadows. Thomas's flight from Colorado had landed safely that afternoon, but Mercy's too careful driving through the snow from the airport made Thomas carsick. Once home, he used a Jake trick. 
ate a sleeve of saltines, washing them down with mineral water infused with floating slices cut from a knuckle of fresh ginger. Now, even with evening upon him, Thomas imagined himself a winter bird looking down from above as he watched out the kitchen window as a cross-country skier left a pair of parallel lines in a snowy wake. He cooked a ground turkey chili, lunch for the upcoming school week, and willed the snow to stop because if it kept up, Mercy would call a snow day. Desperate for distraction, Thomas wanted to get back to work. He ladled the chili into containers to cool on the counter, cranked up the heat, and plopped himself on the couch. He listened as the snow turned to rain and the rain to ice. Then the frozen needles of the evergreens tapped the glass of his living room window. By the time the phone rang, it had gone too dark in Thomas's house to see. He reached over the coffee table and turned on the lamp. The room glowed a reddish gold, a color similar to his best friend's hair. Dana and Thomas caught up by phone most Sunday evenings, and after the usual hellos and how are yous, Thomas admitted that every time he returned from Colorado Springs, he missed Manny like nuts. She said in the phone, of course, cancer is grueling and Manny made you laugh. It's been a long time. Have you called, told him about Jake? I'm not using the brother with cancer card to get the ex's sympathy, Thomas said. The tone Dana used when speaking Manny's name, one of tenderness, caused Thomas's cheeks to go hot. Odd. Other than Mercy, he had told no one at Country Day about the breakup with Manny, nor of Jake's cancer. Not one of his fourth graders, and certainly none of their parents. Mercy finally agreed to professional development as the white lie to account for the occasional Friday or Monday he had taken off to go to Colorado in the nine months since Jake's diagnosis. Mercy had said, you could tell them, openness is a C-day core value. She tried to convince him to discuss Jake's cancer with his students. And you can always mention that you're sad because you miss someone you love, appropriately, she added. No way. Before and after work and on weekends, he dealt with cancer and the fact of being single again, but he didn't want to contend with his students or their parents' reactions. He needed their neediness for problems he could solve. Thomas had first called Dana a week after the initial diagnosis when James, Thomas's older brother's medical school buddy and head and neck oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering had helped a team in Colorado Springs final the diagnosis in Jake's treatment plan. Jake's cancer turned out to be HPV related. Originally, the slides had made it look like another, less treatable strain. James revised his original grim prediction to, if the treatments don't kill him, he'll survive. Are you sure I can't join you for Easter, Dana said? I'm positive. If the PET scans are bad, it'll be a shit show, Thomas said. Thomas looked out the window. He had been fine earlier, but now, talking about Manny and his family, his little house in Portland felt as empty and sprawling as the desert plains he had left behind when he returned from Colorado. Across the street, his neighbors, the Jaracas, had a walnut tree in front of a spotlight above the garage. The wind kept making the bare branches cast shadows, and he felt his evening dread creeping in. I'll never be able to, I'd never be able to work under your circumstances, Dana said. What are you going to do tonight? And please don't say, stay home and grade papers. You're just allergic to work, Thomas said into the phone. For some of us, it's a relief. Thomas had cried only once since the breakup and Jake's diagnosis. The two events had become intertwined in his psyche. Like the sides that made up his brain, each had its own set of characteristics and caused its own set of reactions but they'd also merged into a big blob, affecting everything. A month or so after Manny left, just a couple of weeks after his brother's diagnosis, one of Thomas's students, Toby J, while attempting a complex series of folds to create an origami frog, reminded Thomas of Jake as a boy. He had remembered Jake with the other neighborhood kids his age. They had lined up little toads, a half a dozen or so, that they had gathered from the stream running through the backyard under the McGurin's garage door. Cheered on by the other kids who had squatted down and tried to keep them from jumping out of line, Jake pressed the garage door open, the garage door button, 
And before Thomas had realized what they were up to, they'd squished them all, leaving their skins emptied of their little yellow and white gut sacks. Jake had reveled in the other boy's attention as he bragged about his dad's electric garage door opener. But later, he wept after Maddie smacked his face and made him scrub the dried entrails from the pavement with a bucket and brush. The memory opened a feeling so intense and distant, Thomas couldn't recognize it as his own. He went mute in front of his class in the middle of a sentence. In that pause, he imagined it evening already, at home next to Manny, recalling both stories, the one with Toby and the origami frog, and the one with little Jake with the squished toads. When he realized that Manny wouldn't be there, Thomas motioned to his aide to take over, locked himself in the bathroom, and sobbed. When it finally passed, he could smell his own body's odor under his woodsy, citrusy cologne. Now, a pile of his fourth graders' papers sat next to him on the couch. He swallowed, said, I'm behind. Besides, I can't go out. I'm all dried up. Bullshit, Dana said. The 40s are the new 30s. You're in great shape. I met my sinuses, Thomas said. Colorado, the airplane? They laughed. He felt something rigid in his pocket of his hoodie. Thomas and his nephew, Max, had worked on a thousand piece jigsaw over the last visit, an image of an elephant walking toward the photographer's camera, Kilimanjaro in the background, like a camel's hump on an elephant's back. He pulled the small jagged piece, a shellacked cardboard, from his sweatshirt pocket and stared at it for a long time. Finally, he rotated it 45 degrees, so blue was on top. Under it, dabs of white over brown, a smidge of snow on the tip of a mountain, a tiny piece of sky. I've got a date, Dana said, with a slight tremolo. Another bored housewife, Thomas asked, picturing Dana on her couch with Otto, the purring Himalayan, circling her lap. Um, no, and fuck you very much, she said. That was a phase, not a habit. This one is butch, like out in the WNBA butch, and that's all you're getting. I don't want to drink, jinx it. She sounds cute, Thomas said. She is, and she's got a huge cock, Dana said, a whole collection of them. The image of his best friend shifted from couch and cat and herbal tea to bed and a box of dildos. Charming, Thomas said, and they laughed again. Dana kept him from going morbid. As much now as when the two had met nearly 20 years ago in Berkeley at Cal during grad school. Speaking of cute and butch, how's our Max, Dana asked. Is your nephew gay yet? Not yet, but there's progress, Thomas said, making his way back to the kitchen, turning on the light. He's the public defender of same-sex marriage in Colorado Springs, quite the little activist. Good, Dana said, we need him. It makes me nervous. He's dealing with his classmates, his parents are involved in those weird mega churches, and he's the only black kid in his class. Thomas littered the plastic containers of chili, now just a bit warmer than room temperature. They should move to Portland. Max should go to Country Day, Dana said. Totally, Thomas said. Even with Mercy's recruiting efforts, Country Day had a smaller percentage of black students in Max's school. He closed the refrigerator door and headed to his office. Jake and Cherie worry, and who would blame them? No one. Aren't, this Colorado, aren't the Springs the headquarters for Focus on the Family or whatever it's called? And don't they have an active chapter of the KKK there, Dana? Dana asked. Yes, on the first. Not sure on the second, Thomas said. But he remembered the first time he had taken Max to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. A mom, feeding the giraffes, looked at Thomas, holding his four-year-old Max. She called him an N-lover, actually used the N-word. The giraffe's giant black tongue grabbed the cracker the woman had balanced on her open palm. Then her pink-faced daughter said the word again, pointing at Max, before, the el before mother and daughter joined hands, turned and walked toward the elephants, leaving Max and Thomas and the, giant gir and the giraffe silent, blinking. By the time he had collected his wits and recovered from shock, um, it was too late. His fury turned to guilt for not defending his nephew, too stunned to talk back to the woman. When he returned home, he immediately reported it to Jake, who said, what kind of bubble do you live in that you're so shocked? Shit like that happens all the time. Cherie looked at Jake and laughed at Thomas's naivete. This here, Cherie said, grabbing Max, pointing to Thomas and Jake, it's whiteness. We don't have that. Sigmund, sitting at his desk, phone pressed to his ear, Thomas pulled an envelope from the drawer and put the puzzle piece inside. 
My date just texted. She's waiting outside, Dana said. Send Max my love. Do everything I wouldn't do, Thomas said, lingering on his best friend's face, imagining love, an object he could send. He thought of wrapping the puzzle piece in a sheet of tissue paper, the kind they use at fancy stores. He licked the glue, sealed the elephant, the envelope. The two hung up. Thomas went and turned on the outside floodlight to check on the snow and the rain in the living room window. A pair of eyes reflected the light start, uh, and startled him. Whose dog had gotten into his yard on this too cold night? After locking gazes, Thomas realized that it wasn't a dog, but a coyote with a rabbit or a squirrel in its long snout. The animal's lean body was covered in a thick gray-brown fur, gorgeous against the surrounding white. Its long, bushy tail waved once from side to side. Hello, Thomas said, and tapped his finger on the window. Last year, in a unit on local Native American mythology, a storyteller from the Wasco tribe had come to Country Day for a mini assembly. Sometimes, the man said, the coyote is a hero. In other stories, he's greedy, reckless, and arrogant. In still others, he's a comic tr trickster. Lack of wisdom gets him into trouble. Cleverness gets him out. Then, is he a hero or a fool, one of the kids asked. He's both, the storyteller said, looking weary. Later, Thomas heard the man in the hallway on his phone. Soon after shaking Thomas's hand and graciously receiving the praise of the other teachers, and said, I'm tired of this, these bullshit one-hour gigs that take an hour to get to. They're not really interested in us. They're just checking the box. Now, the coyote put the squirrel on the snow and looked up at Thomas. It's not mine, Thomas said. Take it. As if the animal could hear through the glass, the coyote picked up its meal, turned around, crossed the street, and pranced into the Jiraka's yard before disappearing into the woods. Thank you. All right, well, what a pleasure to introduce Patrick Earl Ryan, who, by the way, um, when we went to undergrad together, which was in the 90s, the 1990s, um, it was an anomaly to be an out queer person in the program. And we were two of three queer people that identified as dudes at the time. And um, one of the three of us looked nothing even remotely like the two of us. But I would go into classes and people would be like, hey, Patrick. And I think the same thing would happen to Patrick. Sometimes they would, they would call him Matthew, um, as if the two out gay guys that looked somewhat similar to one another were the same person. But I always thought it was a compliment because he was such a good writer. <laughs> and I never knew exactly. I, I would be like, hey, I wouldn't correct them. <laughs> um, because I thought Patrick's stories were so, so incredible. So Patrick Earl Ryan was born and raised in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, in a family spanning five continents and seven generations in the city. His debut short story collection, If We Were Electric, and by the way, I've read every single one of these stories, and also Stacy's incredible um, novella um, from front to back, and more than once, and so I, I couldn't recommend them um, more highly. It's such a relief to love the work that your friends produce, because um, it doesn't always go that way. Um, if We Were Electric was, was chosen by the great Roxane Gay and was the winner of the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction, published in 2020 by University of Georgia Press. His stories have appeared in Ontario Review, Pleiades, Best New American Voices, Men on Men, Best New Gay Fiction for the Millennium, Karen, James White Review, and Gertrude. And he was the founding editor-in-chief of the LGBTQIA++ literary journal, Lodestar Quarterly. Please welcome Patrick Earl Ryan. Thank you, Matthew. That was a sweet introduction. I have so many memories. This is the first time I'm back at State in 20 years. Um, so it's really fascinating to be here and see how little has changed. <laughs> I was walking up the halls, and I was like, it's just, it's amazing. I feel like I'm back in, in school again. Um, I will be reading a shortened version of a short story called Where It Takes Us from the collection, uh, just so we can fit it into, into our time. 
So th like I said, this is called Where It Takes Us. I haven't told you about my real brother, Jack Perry Dunstan Jr., oldest of five boys, named after Jack Swersey and Perry Como, tower supervisor at the Sewage and Water Board, pot smoker and rock and roll man. One day he wanted to go to the drag races in Destrehan. The Sunday before, he cut out the newspaper ad and taped it to the fridge. Hot summer drags, Kenny Bernstein and 4 O Joe head to head. I carried the ice cooler from the car to our seats, struggling to make it without taking a breather. My fingers throbbed in the handles. I strained to keep my back straight. And I knew everyone was making fun of me as soon as I huffed and puffed past them. An imposter in the camp of good old boys. I regretted wearing Doc Martens in khaki shorts. The men spit at their feet, walking beside us with hands in their pockets, plodding along in a stupendously manful way like penguins. Three teenage Billy Idols with bleached and spiked hair had just unrolled a 10-foot-long banner over the front railing when we climbed onto the bleachers. They painted one of the racers' names across it in big red bubble letters, Harry Holloway, followed by a bright yellow, you rock, and a little boxy doodle that must have been a racing car with jet engines. The track stretched out beneath their sign, a slick bowl of black pavement slanted up at the far ends like an interstate exit ramp. I could smell the tar and gasoline the moment we came upon it. I could even taste it on my tongue, like driving into a giant gas station. From what I could tell, nothing more than the straight span of, of track immediately in front of us would be used for the races. They'd sectioned off everything else with those inflated orange cushions used for high jumping and pole vaults. An EMT sat on the bumper of an ambulance parked on the lawn, swinging his legs back and forth like pendulums. You don't mind being here, Jack asked me as we decided on our stainless steel seats between a man with a plastic cup of beer in each hand and another man spreading a thick coating of sunblock over his already reddened armed arms, lending the rank sweetness of coconuts to the mechanical odor of petroleum. I thought for a second, even though I shouldn't have answered without thinking at all, as two race cars revved up their engines and assumed precise positions on the start line, going forward and then backward three or four times. We shielded our eyes from the glare of the sun and tried to see who was in the cars. It's a new experience, I finally said. I always like new experiences. I don't know why mom worries so much, he said. I hope I didn't ruin any big plans for you. A beanstalk man in a black cowboy hat knocked on one car's windshield. The driver held his helmet out the window for the man, climbed out of the cockpit, skipped around in his costume like a debonair space-aged boxer, stretched his arms out above his head, and then grabbed the helmet back. A pink ram charged across the ink, uh, the ink blue body of his roadster. Behind its hind legs ran the name Bell Dodge, Louisiana. Is he famous, I asked Jack, showing enthusiasm in the most believable way I could as the racer and the man in the cowboy hat discussed things that I imagine must be critical to everyone's safety life and death things, loose bolts and high temperatures, directions of the wind and tire pressures. That's Harry Holloway, he told me. I went to high school with him. Harry won the race. People in the bleachers went to congratulate him. Kids asked for autographs. Girls showing off their sunburned shoulders hugged him and kissed his cheek. But Jack waited silently for the next race. I wondered if he felt ill again. I casually inspected his forehead for excess sweat and watched how often he bobbed his Adam's apple. We ate our sandwiches, watching fat bursts of flame spit out of the rear ends of the next duo of mutant cars, and every now and then I checked my watch. Fifteen races later, I was tired and bored. One minute the machines were quivering with trepidation, corked up like champagne bottles at the beginning of the track. Their drivers possessed by some speed-hungry spirit focused on the quarter mile ahead of them. And then with a gunshot that was lost in the roar of their engines, they flashed across the asphalt, melting their monstrous tires, front ends almost floating up into the sky. And in 10 seconds, it was all over. So quick, it was impossible for me to get worked up over it. There wasn't enough time to build any suspense. 
How could anyone predict a winner or call what these drivers were doing a skill? Yet when I looked at Jack, looking at these cars zooming from start to finish line, the briefest and smallest of actions, I saw amazement. I realized that there must be so much more in those 10 seconds than I could ever have imagined. By evening, everyone else was tired too, but the last race of the day roused them out of their seats one more time. Even I gripped the hot steel of the seat beneath me and held my breath for a moment as one of the cars almost spun out of control, brushing and bouncing against the other racer halfway down the track. A white spark popped up from between them. I'm sure I wasn't the only person who imagined the crash, even if it didn't happen, and the shards of red-hot metal whizzing into the bleachers at super speeds, but the other car maintained control and crossed the finish line while the almost perished speedster stalled mid-track. I wondered if the man would ever come out. I thought he might be too embarrassed or injured or scared. Then, two or three minutes after the winner had driven off the track, a team of men ran out to that car, and finally the driver climbed out his cockpit, dusting off his uniform, looking pissed off at the world. Like every other crash or possible crash that I witnessed, I thought of Jack's accident in 1982. I'm sure Jack always thought of the same thing too. It wasn't even on a racetrack. A car ran a red light at the intersection of River Road and St. Charles Avenue, just a few hundred feet from the river and smashed right into his motorcycle. Hit and run at 9.55 on a Friday night. The impact threw him 20 feet onto the railroad tracks along the bottom of the levee, knocked unconscious. If it weren't for another driver who stopped and dragged him away from the tracks, the 10 o'clock train would have severed his body. The doctors only put a pin in his left leg, but the blood transfusion that was supposed to save his life gave him HIV. So every time I see an accident or even hear about an accident, I think of Jack's accident and I wonder whatever happened to the guy that hit my brother. After the races, we walk back to the parking lot, other people sho shoving past us, pulling their kids along, finishing off their hot cans of beer, cooing about the last moments of frenzy and the winners and losers, and slapping fives and tens into each other's hands to pay off their wagers. Everyone who walked past Jack's Camaro regarded it as if the car were a rare and remarkable sculpture too. They bent down for a closer look at the polished rims, the wild horse across the grill, the hand detailing. They made eloquent, eloquent comments. Check it out. What a freaking rad set of rims. That's a fucking beauty. I'm sure it made Jack proud. We didn't even drive off right away. We sat in the car, the backs of my knees already dripping wet, and watched everyone else wave goodbyes, honking their horns at each other, spinning out like the speed machines that were still in their minds. Every now and then, I pointed out another car before it disappeared on the highway, too. That one's got nice stripes. I was sore in the back of my legs from sitting on the bleachers all day, trying to relax in the shade that the Camaro offered. I wanted to sound like I'd really enjoyed myself. They all want to be like those race cars, I said. I knew it took 45 minutes to get back home and it was already approaching seven. Somehow, maybe telepathically, I also knew our mom was eyeballing our stainless steel clock over the refrigerator every half minute, stacking the clean dishes into the cabinets, wiping down the stovetop, taking out the garbage, feeding the dogs, and anything else she could do to occupy herself until we arrived home safely. I'm sure she was imagining what she would tell the nurse if we didn't show up on time. But Jack wouldn't start the car. He sat there and looked out of his window, rubbing his legs up and down as if he was cold, but it was broiling hot in the car. He'd lost a lot of weight in the hospital. You could see it. All of the sweating and the sun had a way of making it more obvious. And then he said out of the blue, do you still believe in God? After a minute and a half, of thinking the question over, all I could come up with was, I don't know. Gee, I, I really don't know. I don't think I've ever believed in God, but I didn't want to take something important away from Jack. I didn't want to discourage my brother from believing in something that might help him through the pandemonium. I never did either, he confessed. 
but now I'm rethinking it all, you know? Yeah, sure, I said. I do that sometimes, too. He twirled the keys around his index finger. Do you think I can beat this, he asked. Mom prays so much for me, and Dana does, too. I know people die from it, but maybe when people pray? I slumped in my seat and shut my eyes tight. I wanted to rub them. My whole face burned. I, I think you can beat it if you can convince yourself you can. That's what I think, too, he told me. If I just take my medicines the way they say, keep doing everything I would have been doing anyway, I can just fight it out of me. Yeah, I agreed. Everything was plausible. We knew nothing. We were the only car left in the parking lot, only the sprawling sheet of white concrete in us. I felt tiny. The sun had dropped in the sky, growing bigger and redder the longer we sat there, daubing the clouds as it fell and turning the concrete the same raging red. The bleacher's shadow crept up and over our car and then simply vanished. A flock of pigeons darted overhead, little black shapes in the sky, and then disappeared too, into the trees on the other side of the road. Then Jack started the engine, and I was happy we wouldn't cause Mom a heart attack until I realized that he wasn't driving back to the highway. Instead, he pulled up to the track's entrance and stopped. An iron barnyard gate that restrict restricted access to the track usually swung open and closed, but was now locked with a thick metal chain and a deadbolt. Jack put the car into park and let the engine run. You're going to think I'm crazy, he said, but will you help me open it? That, I asked, pointing at the gate. Please, he said. I don't think he'd ever said please to me before, not for anything else. Jack pulled a crowbar out of the trunk, and we walked up to the gate. The moment we were in front of it, I felt criminal, like a thug. I could feel the pulse in my neck. We took turns watching out for security or the unconcerned passerby on the highway. From far away, with the sinking sun transforming us into shadow puppets, I'm sure we didn't look half as conspicuous as I imagined. After Jack tried to snap the chain, he handed the crowbar, crowbar to me. I tried and handed the crowbar back to him. Then, understanding we weren't getting anywhere, we held on to it together. The loud clank of the iron chain popping made us both jump, and we laughed at each other. I swung the gate open, and its hinges cackled back. We got back into the car and drove onto the track, one tractor waiting on the other side, ready for the groundskeeper to drive it over the grass in the morning. Aside from that, the grounds were abandoned and emptied. I held out my arm out of the window, hoping for a breeze now that it was evening. I could still get a whiff of gasoline and burned rubber. Jack took it slow, a dreamy and almost imperceptible progress, careful not to rev the engine or make any unnecessary noise. Once we re reached the broad yellow start line, he, st he turned the car around. I could hear the tires moving over, over the black pavement until we faced the long straight stretch that we'd already seen 20 cars race across and everything went quiet. I knew it would be dark in a matter of minutes. I knew that we'd probably get arrested too or reprimanded and kicked out of the place forever once we'd been discovered, which seemed inevitable. My whole body shook with fear, the kind of wimpy and incriminating panic that goes right to your stomach. I wanted to find a bathroom. Don't ever do this again, Jack said to me. Don't ever do anything stupid for the rest of your life. Don't get arrested. Don't piss people off. Don't take a piss on the side of the road. Don't even lie. I nodded, swallowing heavily. Gotcha, I said. And don't tell mom, he said. Don't tell mom, I repeated back to him, solidifying our pack, suddenly grinning at our little caper. He was late for his medications, and we wouldn't make it back for the, for the home nurse. I could only imagine the thoughts running through my mom's brain. It was likely the end of the world, but I couldn't say a word to it. I knew what he was doing. For once, I realized what it meant to have a brother, something that had never occurred to me before, and I desperately wanted to be there with him. I hated that I probably would never do, with the, do this with him again. The last few minutes of the sunset were so incredibly beautiful in such a practiced and inescapable way. The world seemed wrong. 
Even though Jack and I didn't move a muscle, everything felt so alive and full, and I realized how unfair it was for Jack to be terminally sick. He had this look on his face, like he wanted to be right there forever, like a kid about to go on his first roller coaster ride. I shut my eyes and imagined Jack and I trading places. Me in the driver's seat. Then my head smacked the back of the seat, and we soared down the deserted track. The harpies screamed, the tires struggling, endeavoring, and finally achieving friction with pavement vibrated in my ears as they whirled a thousand miles per hour. I grabbed the sides of my seat, feeling the world shake as Jack screamed joyously. Everything came out, every sound and pitch again and again. I knew that flashing lights and sirens would greet our private victory. I knew we'd soon suffer the wrath of mom, but the wind kept blowing into my face, spurting through the windows like a ton of ice blue water, and Jack kept screaming. So I gripped the seat tighter and tighter, drowning in it, until my fingers were probably as red as the last bit of sun in the sky, and I clenched my teeth until I forced myself to look at a blur of dark pavement, purple as heaven, and I screamed with him. Thank you. Thank you very much.
extraordinary Something's got a hold on me I get this feeling I'm in motion A certain sense of liberty The chances are we've gone too far You took my time and you took my money Now I feel you've left me standing And I will last so to go for 20 minutes, right? Yeah, whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, that's 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. We do audience questions first or do we just talk? Yeah, I put it up. Like it's we, you can just start talking with each other and asking each other's questions. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then someone will ask. If you want to move that around to. Do you, do you think we need to? You might. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Because it's recording too. It's okay. Yeah. Are we on? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, um, thank you so much for your incredible readings. It was uh, a joy to be. 
I'm, I'm a middle child, and um, Thomas in my book is a middle child, and it was so nice to be in between two of my <laughs> MFA at San Francisco State <laughs> brothers. So, thank you so much. We'd be back in the, just here, again, just here, we both read, it's just fantastic. Right? Just give me back into, again, the spirit of just state and good literature, so thank you both. It was such a different time when we were here. Yes. Definitely, yeah. Uh, well, San Francisco certainly was a, a different place then as well. Um, what would but you I say? was a different person, too. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I, like, what would you say, because you both are still uh, located here, what would you say has changed unexpectedly? Changed unexpectedly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You go ahead, Patrick. I don't think anything is really unexpected. I, I kind of mm-hmm. expected all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it seemed like the traje- tra- trajectory that it was, uh, that I had seen from like the early days of the, the dot-com industry in the late mm-hmm. 90s. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> I love San Francisco. I, I really do, but I'm a New Orleanian, you know, in my heart. Um, so th- there's something about San Francisco, I think, that, that has become a little colder to me. Mm. That's what I feel, yeah. Mm. So that when, now when I go back home to New Orleans, it's, it's even more uh, drastic of a, of a difference between that sort of southern hospitality and, and being here. I think, uh, and people are a little bit more withdrawn, I think, here now. I think pandemic-wise or just in general? That, that in general, I think. Well, I remember when we were all here together, mm-hmm. it was like I, I had um, four waiter shifts, two at night, two lunch shifts, and a breakfast shift. And I could pay my rent, have a cute outfit, pay my tuition, pay my books, and put myself through school. And, and it was manageable. I had two roommates. and um, We converted like the living room into a bedroom. But still, we had this incredible flat on Divisadero Street. And for $900 a month, we split the rent. And, uh, um, you know, we could really make it work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I still teach here, you know, so I never really, I did leave San Francisco State for a couple of years. But Mm -hmm. um, seeing my students now and the amount of tuition, the cost of living in San Francisco and what have you, to me, it's such a dramatic shift. It's like a very different demographic, like, you know, the. The California State University system is based on this idea that anybody that wants an education could get one. And I know that you and I, for sure, were in that. I know that you went to film school prior to coming here. Right. But right. Patrick and I both didn't, neither one of us came from families that went to college. No, I was the first in my family to ever go to college. Yeah, same with my generation, my older brother. So my mom did go to nursing school and stuff afterwards, mm-hmm. but and then went and got some major lesbian degrees. <laughs> Eventually, but um, you know, but when I started here, um, we, we were we were putting ourselves through school, mm-hmm. and that was something that was really possible. So, how would you say you being in state for, for such a such a while? How would you say the education, the course of education, has changed, or has it? Well, I guess I'm the only one that can answer. I was like, Patrick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that one of the things that I can say that has evolved in such an incredible way is that, you know, we were sort of forced to take a bunch of English classes that we may not have been interested in mm-hmm. or that may not have sparked um, the kinds of things. Like, I was, I considered myself an activist when mm-hmm. I came to San Francisco State. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't necessarily want, I'm glad that I read, you know, Wordsworth or Shelley or whoever, but... I felt like what I really needed to be reading was a lot of what I found at the Poetry Center. Mm. And at the time, Jewel Gomez was here. <laughs> of course, he was here, and Jewel Gomez mm-hmm. was my first teacher, and also a good friend of Patrick's and such. And it was, um, but it, there was sort of a little bit of a disconnect between my daily life and what happened at San Francisco State. And I think now students really can choose a, a much more broad um, selection of courses in order to kind of seek out the kind of writing that they want to do. And I think that that's one of the really good evolutions of the program since we were here. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, so in the piece that you read today, mm-hmm. um, I'm really interested in uh, how memory and also what we carry with us as we move forward and minister in your book is bringing a lot with him. We learned in that passage that you read that his daughter died and tragically by falling down a well. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't learn in that passage, I don't think, but that his, his wife um, also right. left him. Right. But then he's, he's, he's embarking on a, a, an important part of our history 
with the um, Great Migration and getting on the train and going, but he's carrying all of that with him. Mm -hmm. And then same thing, I think, in, in your yeah. book, too, Patrick. There's a lot yeah. about memory and what we bring mm -hmm. with each other. But also in Downing Thompson, I mean, there's, there's this idea of the connection and how memory serves that and how memory, how things reflect upon that. And I think that's just something that comes out on both of your works fantastically, right? Is the idea that there is no stopping, there is no point in which a memory no longer carries with us. Right? There is no point in which something that happens, or that event is just something that happens at a single point of time and then we just move from it. Oftentimes it carries in some ways. Um, the idea of ghosts or mm -hmm. spirits or um, the idea that um, you can leave those behind at a certain location, oftentimes just carry them with them. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something, that's, for, for my character, Minister, definitely, I think that's something that Thomas carries the effects of the rest happening to him with him. And I think that in your short stories as well, people just carry that effect. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want to either move past it, they want to get away, they oftentimes we, we want to leave towns, but the impact of that is going to be, still be there. And no matter if they change the location, this thing that they just have to deal with, it's just, if they don't, it just carries. I just, I just love that about literature. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in my story, The Blue Sun, I, I work with memory as well too. And, and it's this idea of uh, that a mother's memory when she's lost her son, and I know we deal with death in a lot of our stories as well, um, that the memory is there so alive that it actually manifests as a ghost. So that the, the memory becomes a ghost. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's such a tangible thing, especially in Southern fiction, that you, you get that a lot. Because in, in Southern fiction, of course, there's always that big memory, right, that everybody's thinking about, which is, you know, the war, the Civil War. It always comes back to that for Southerners in, in some way or another. So uh, memory is, I always feel like memory for a Southerner is something that has a particular weight to it, regardless of what side, um, you know, you might have been on. With that. Mm -hmm. Oh right, yeah, and mm, yeah, I hear I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I think too that there's also something that's very unique to prose, and we were at the poetry center, but we were invited as like the, the prose, <laughs> the prose moment, <laughs> the poetry exactly. center's calendar. And uh, um, one of the things that I love most about prose is it really is the art form that can illuminate the you know, unlike painting, unlike sculpture, unlike so many other dance, so many other incredible art forms that move us and move our spirit and allow us to know ourselves and each other better or, uh, and more, uh, or at least sort of unfold the mystery of what we can't know about ourselves and each other, that there is that exploration of the contrast between the um, inner private life and the performed public self. And I think that I really get such a distinction in both your works between what it is that a character is willing to reveal about themselves through their actions and how they're moving through the world and um, what they're thinking and feeling in contrast to that. It's, it's really intense. So that's one of the things that I love most about prose and I was curious if that resonated with other people. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, just again, the idea of um, that connection that you can have or lose or the ways in which things can just kind of, again, resonate and that, that stays. So yeah, I think, I think so as well. And I think that's kind of interesting that all three of us, even though of course we uh, came out of school around the same time, short stories, novel, novella. Um, so we're all, we are looking at that idea of, of it all the way through, even though we, we're looking at it through different forms. So, you know, and I think that, you know, we're talking about three genres here and it just so happens that we each represent one genre. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know in, in your case, you prefer novellas. Um, you'll probably okay. con continue to write about them. Mm -hmm. I am a short story writer, so I, I do prefer the short story, although I've written novels that haven't been published yet. Um, but I, I feel stronger about my short stories. But I think also when we're talking about these things like memory and, and how they can exist in a, in a story, um, they can be specific to the genre as well. Like each genre handles these a little bit differently. Um, like, you know, I think for a short story that it's always about one particular moment that you are focusing on and then that's sort of uh, what surrounds that moment. Um, whereas the novella, I've never written a novella, but, but I imagine it's, it's something between them. <laughs> 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 something between them. <laughs> Maybe you should sit there. <laughs> I don't know, right? Just make the air yeah. flow. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, there's, 
the novella takes that same idea. Short story, I think, is really great being that here's that one moment and something has exploded, right? Something has, or is about to explode, right? And here's the, the shrapnel that detritus from that, right? And I think that for a, no, for a novella, at least, it's this thing has exploded and has caused someone else to do something, right? So the explosion has happened. Um, and it's really not just the impact of that, but it's really causing something to, to move in a certain direction. Whereas I think for the novel, this is really well done in Dolly Thomas, the explosion has happened, it causes for something to happen, and that thing that's happening now also causes other things. Right? I think that's where you get the great subplots, where you get the great um, different characters that actually, that actually come into it. So I think all of that is actually leading up to something, or just, again, that explosion has happened. And the novel really does a great job, I think, of really just expanding upon that in different avenues. Well, you know, I always say that you're not friends with Matthew because you want to hear the short version of the story, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that for me, it's like probably lack of skill that, I mean, I do have some short stories that I'm kind of proud of, but they're usually, I do look at the short story that as a um, container or the novella as a container in order to do chapters. Mm. And in the chapter that I read today, one of the reasons that it's fun for me is because I like to throw a bunch of dice on the table and then pick them all bit by bit. And so if, you, if you're not nerdy and you're not paying attention, you may not notice, but like, you know, you, you find out that there's a chili cooking on the stove, that there's the light going down, that there's snow happening, and that there's, um, you know, you know, a piece, a piece of a puzzle in a pocket. And I just try to like throw all of those things out on the table and see whether or not by the end of the chapter I can collect them and put them back together in some way. And then, you know, set up the next thing. And I think that I'm so utter, utterly um, referential. Mm -hmm. Like every single thing reminds me of 10 other mm -hmm. things. That the novel is a good um, container for me because you know, I, I, the, I have gotten criticized for having too much flashback as if that interferes with the, the action. And I understand, I think, that the, for a certain kind of reader that wants tons of action, that it can seem stilted or interrupted by those things. But I feel like this present moment can really trigger a kind of memory. And then, and then, then we start trying to predict the future in order to avoid the disasters of the past. And that's what the present moment is for me. And I feel like the novel can really capture that experience. Yeah. Um, but you will do it too. It's just that you do it so much more economically. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just don't have to keep studying. No, but, <laughs> but I think especially with, with Downing Thomas again, what's done is it does not, I'm surprised, like, it's like the dice, it feels like it's all earned. It feels like at the end of that chapter, I needed to know that. And I'm surprised like, also by the flashback commentary that, that you've gotten because it feels like there's, there's information that I need to move the story forward. And as long as the information I need to move the story forward, then I, I don't think that it ends the velocity or anything that you, that you have. Right? And so I think that's just, if it was for me in reading it, it went through very smoothly. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't something that, here's a flashback that's going to take me out of the story. It's, here's a flashback that's going to enhance the, to the direction, the, the trajectory that we're going with. Right? Oh, it all seemed very organic to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's a luxury to have a bad Goodreads to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, if I publish a book, I wonder what they're going to say in Goodreads. And then when somebody looks like, oh, too many flash. You didn't even think that that's such a joy. Have you guys um, looked at your feedback uh, the, in areas the like... The best bad Goodreads that I've gotten. And again, like it's a joy to get a bad Goodreads. If you, if, for those who haven't gotten one, haven't published yet, enjoy your bad Goodreads. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a gift. <laughs> it so, because the, the best one that I've gotten was, it wasn't romantic enough. I'm like, did you not read the back of They the book? wanted Lana to get together with I, I guess, <laughs> something like, but I was like, it wasn't, and you see the person's, because oftentimes, also on Goodreads, you can see what that person has liked, right? And this person likes, like the bodice ripper, the people. Who are, I'm like, why did you buy this book? Like, like what did you think mine was gonna be? Like, it's all like, just, just huge, like long romance novels set in the South, right? Where it's, where it's just all just things burning in the background, where someone's swooning at some point, right? All on the covers, and I was like, and you bought this? So. Right. Yeah. Amazon recommendations sometimes, you know, uh, lead you in the wrong direction. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> have you read that. any of your... your I have. Um, I, one of the things that I remember from Goodreads uh, was someone gave my book two stars <laughs> and said, um, 
this was really heavy. Too heavy <laughs> for me. And, that was, and, it's, and this is what we now call Yelp. It's like one star for the restaurant because I had a bad day. Yeah. But um, the, I, I love that because it's true. It's true. I'm sure if you clicked on them, like I got, I have been pretty lucky. We all have been. Uh, yeah. We've all been given really some lucky. nice compliments. Yes. So we should um, not just dwell on the negative, <laughs> but I'm amused by it because I think that that, um, right, when you click on what else they've read, it's just like, you're giving me one star when your reading list is Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hating. It's just, I like, how did Down yeah. Thomas give <laughs> it's like, oh. you? Yeah. So fun. It's all fun. So how has the publication process been for, for Um, You know, I, maybe I'm not the best person to start on this, because mine was a bit more complicated, I think. Um, you know, my, my book came out because I won an award. So I yes. won the Flannery O'Connor Award. Um, so it, it, it got, um, I mean, that was wonderful. And I appreciate it so much. I think that the timing of my book came out right when the pandemic was really, it was, it was 2020, September of 2020. Mm. So the traction just wasn't there to kind of push the book through into a market. When you're, you know, I, I think what happened during the pandemic for a lot of writers is that, um, and a lot of readers as well, is that what people did was they went to writers that they knew already. You know, they wanted to read something comforting for them. So I think a lot of new writers didn't get a lot of readers um, during that first year of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so it was interesting to, to, kind of, uh, to kind of deal with that. You know, when you have certain expectations about what might happen when you finally, especially for all three of us, right, because we waited 20 years. <laughs> so finally, 20 mm -hmm. years, right, I'm like, one of these years it's going to happen. <laughs> And then when does it happen? It happens during a pandemic, Derek, right. um, which is fine, which is fine. And, and uh, really, the connections I've made through publishing uh, this book um, have just been gorgeous. I mean, beautiful friendships that have come from it, connections in, in the industry as well. Um, so the publishing process, I think, has been, a, uh, it taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to do a lot of my own PR. Mm -hmm. um, um, but but it's been yeah it's been it's been odd it's been nothing like what I expected it would be yeah that's fair but I've learned a lot and I'm like I'm now I know what to do for the second yeah. book very fair Matthew? well for the nine years that I was a student here I was also a waiter at this restaurant called Il Fernayo in the Lee Plaza and I couldn't get those tables to listen to me get to the end of the specials. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that anyone anywhere has bought a 300-page book of mine and read every single page of it, to me, is just is like, I can't, I can't believe it. Like, there is not one single message that I received my entire life that anybody would ever want to hear, a single thing mm -hmm. that I had to say. Mm -hmm. So to have uh, um, kept writing all of the years when I wasn't mm -hmm. getting the validation from the publishing mm -hmm. industry, I mean, we did publish some great things mm -hmm. during that time, and you had your plays produced and what have you and so it wasn't like we were doing nothing but right. <clears throat> to um i know that the world is uh, bias i know that there is homophobia is alive in publication i got rejected in ways that are like we did a we did a gay book this year literally it was like i have the signed page that i have kept in case i ever i'm so desperate for money i can like you know go and threaten somebody that I'm going to show it to the world if they don't pay me cash or whatever. But the, the, I just, I've been thrilled. And I, I don't, really don't care. I mean, of course, there's there's situations where it's just like, oh, I dreamed that it would be this way and that and, and, and what have you. And I haven't gone to the East Coast yet. Mm. But it's just been in, in, I highly recommend it for anyone that hasn't done it. Um, I kept writing. I didn't need the validation of the publishing world. There were dark, you know, nights of the soul because I thought that, you know, when is it going to be my turn sometimes? And I would get a little bit self-pitying every now and again. But more, I love teaching so much that I mm. kind of didn't need a book. Mm. Mm. So the fact that I've gotten one and that some people have paid attention to it in the ways that they have has been unbelievable for me. So good. How about you? I mean, your your book has gotten, I mean, a novella is like, that's not a, nobody gets a novella out there in the world like you have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so many other people I spoke to before, I was like, you have a novella? Um, which is, which is again, it's been fun. And the whole process for me has just been great. Of course, like, uh, at least during the pandemic, we had some, had some challenges and things like that. That's going to 
I pretty much knew that as when I uh, came around to the publication date. But yeah, it was, it's just been like the all of the horror stories, and we've all heard like the horror stories. I think they're gonna happen, and they've happened to others, right? So um, knock on all wood, they haven't happened to me. Um, just the entire journey has just been fun. Um, everyone's been fantastic. Um, it's just been yeah, it's just been such a fantastic ride. And again, it, it was something that, again, went into with the idea of just to see what's going to happen with this right? and enjoying every step of it. And from festivals, from readings, from even the online um, community, it's just been really supportive and great. Yeah. Even work has been supportive and great, too. Yeah. You guys, I'm so proud of each of you. It's just like the books are so, <laughs> so, so, good. so, so good. And I hope that... that uh, that you'll continue to gain traction and that, you know, well. never know what's going to happen yeah, with the yeah, book. True. Sometimes yeah. there's a delay between. It just yeah. takes one little thing, like yeah. one yeah. tweet. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe Roxanne Gay can choose your book for her book. Club. Right. <laughs> Chosen it for a, an award. That's, that's amazing. But yeah, yes, fantastic. So again, to end up with working on anything new? Yes. Um, so a great deal of freedom came about from winning the Flannery O'Connor Award because for 20 years, I got an agent right out of the MFA program. Um, it was pretty immediate. I, actually, I was still in the MFA program when I got my agent. Okay. And I had, um, I had a story collection very similar to this one. It was, mm -hmm. it was slightly different. Some stories were shared. There's some new ones that came about. And, um, and I gave it to my agent, and he was like, okay, that's fine, but uh, people want a novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so then I spent the next, you know, five years writing a novel, gave it to him, and uh, nothing came of it. And, um, and, I, and I just kind of I had it in my head, because you trust your agent, so I had it in my head that, um, well, I think what I need to do is write a novel. And that he said, just put the short story collection aside. You, people don't want that as a first book. You know, and, and all of this, this rhetoric about what the, the publishing industry wants. Um, 20 years, you know, of that, and then I finally said, you know, um, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to send this out and try mm -hmm. to get it published. I mm -hmm. feel strongly about the short story. It's my preferred genre. I, I wrote, I tried to write a novel. It's fine. Who knows? Maybe one day it'll come out. Um, but, but now, since I won that award, I feel so renewed in my love for the short story. Mm -hmm. So since October of last year, maybe, I think, September or October last year, I've written a new collection. Oh, so I've cool. written about 14 stories. Um, I'm about to start the polishing uh, uh -huh. phase of, of that. Um, they're set in New Orleans again, um, which is, you know, that's my thing. Cool. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm working on. I have a new, a new collection. That's awesome. And we're almost out of time, but uh, I just, you know, you know, there's a thousand more questions that I'm going to have to ask. <laughs> the time. Um, I, I guess I'll say the thing that I'm working on, I, I do have another novel, which, I, which, which I'm polishing. It's filled with ghosts, literally and figuratively. Um, and a friend of mine just read it. It's been tentatively titled, it's been titled Letters to the Dead for 20 years. But mm -hmm. my friend was like, I think we should rename it Fat Hag, the, mm -hmm. the, the woman that wrote, wrote it. And Monique in the audience here is giving <laughs> <laughs> props for the new title. Um, and then I have a textbook that's what we're finishing up with now. And then I also am working on a ma uh, memoir, my life story. It's titled Failure. And it's sort of um, <laughs> looking at how all of these things that I tried and that didn't quite work out ended up, you know, on some deeply literary level being okay. <laughs> um, the, I was going to ask you something. What was it that... What was I going to ask you um, before what you talk that? about what you, were, what, what you were going to what you were going to what you're working on next? But I was um, did are, did anybody like write in with a question or do can we know? No, okay. All right, sorry. I just wanted to know what, what you were what you were working on now. Yeah, what too. are you working on? It's fun. So I have another novella that I'm working on, and it was about anesthesiologists. And I had researched a lot about anesthesiologists. And then I had a friend read like a portion of it. He said, why would an anesthesiologist be doing this? I'm like, oh, man, you're right. So that's off to the side. And essentially now I have the pirate story, the infamous pirate story. And the pirate story is just my cheap project. It's a really long story that has nothing to do with anything. It's just about pirates. I'm 70 pages in. There are no pirates. I don't know. So at some point, 
there may a pirate may show up. It may not show up. I'm just calling a pirate story for now. So um, hopefully it never sees the light of day. Hopefully no one sees this. Uh, <laughs> if things go wrong with the novella, then it may be the pirate story. But if not, nothing bad. I remember how <laughs> private you were about like a big issue that nobody can see it until you were and so, absolutely. And it was absolutely yeah. No, I remember what I was going to say. Sorry that uh -huh. I got distracted. And yeah. I just, just, I wanted to give a shout out to our presses, just because yes. what you were mentioning about the shorts rate. The reason why I had I, your agent and I were flirting with one another for a time before I signed with somebody else, and basically he was just like, "Could it be like more vampire?" <laughs> It's like, it was industry. It was like what was popular in the yeah. in the industry at the time. It was money based, mm -hmm. and so the um, you know the University of Georgia Press mm -hmm. and the Flannery O'Connor Award, Lantern Fish, yeah. and in my case, Amble Press. These are the independent, like doing it for love, mm -hmm. presses that have allowed us to to just express ourselves artistically without so much worry about. Yeah. Um, what the, the bottom line dollar is. Fantastic. So I just, I am so grateful for both of your presses um, to bring your works to me yeah, yeah. and so grateful for my press for yeah. not caring so much about that stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks, right. small presses. Thanks, yeah. Poetry Center. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you, Poetry Center. Yeah.